Welcome back to the Daily Social Distancing Show. My first guest is the Emmy and Oscar-winning filmmaker Alex Gibney. He's here to talk about his powerful new HBO documentary about the opioid crisis. When you as the rep walk in there, they run to you with a pen to sign and they're running away at the same time because they don't have time to talk with you because they're treating patients making money. And if he's a red and he's a businessman, I gotta show him the WIFM. What is the WIFM? W-I-F-M. What's in it for me? That's all they're thinking. What's in it for me? Buddy, will you stop talking about the freaking drug? Will you stop talking about saving the patient? Will you stop talking about the science? And will you please tell me what's in it for me? Because you're wasting my time. Those are the reds. Those are the doctors you want to find. Alex Gibney, welcome to the Daily Social Distancing Show. <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. Um, the last time you were on our show was in 2018. And you were on with, um, it was your documentary, Dirty Money. Now you are back with another documentary about a topic that I, I can't even explain to you how infuriating it makes me as a person because A, of what was done to people, B, of what the ramifications have been, and C, why it feels like almost nothing is going to happen in the way of justice. And that is all about the opioid epidemic. Tell me a little bit about your documentary. It's a two-parter on HBO. It's a two-part doc, four hours, called The Crime of the Century. And the reason I called it The Crime of the Century and the reason I was interested in doing it was it seemed like the opioid crisis was being presented to us almost like a natural disaster, like a hurricane or a flood, as if it just happened. Um, but um, upon an examination, it seems clear that it was manufactured, manufactured by a number of key corporations and so there's a crime there, and therefore there are people to be held to account. And therefore there are things that were done wrong that hopefully set right. And what's really interesting in this story, I didn't know some of these parts, was how these drug companies, Purdue in particular, said, you know what, we're going to make sure we get these drugs to the people. We're going to trick everybody from the government through to the consumer and make sure that they take as much of these pills as possible. The question I have for you is, how on earth do they trick the FDA? We got our hands on a document that seems to indicate that actually they got to a person inside the FDA. It was actually the, the medical officer examining the application and they turn him. And, and in fact, he cooperates with them in terms of reviewing their own application. It's like, wow. A, um, and, and then a, a year after leaving the FDA, lo and behold, he gets a job with Purdue for about close to four hundred thousand dollars wow uh, coincidence I, I think not this is one of the saddest crime stories for me because it does not end with a sense of justice it does not end with a sense of the world is in a better place because the company itself doesn't suffer and neither does the family who's made all of the money that's right and now you're referring to purdue now in in a few rare occasions some executives have been committed and have gone to prison in the case of insis for example but we see more often it's the mid-level dealers who get nabbed uh the walter whites who get nabbed and the people at the tippy top the sackler family for example or the key executives at, at purdue didn't do any time. And it's worse than just them getting off scot-free. We, we got our hands on a 120-page prosecution memo, which was prepared by federal prosecutors, that argued strongly that top executives at Purdue should be charged with felonies. Mysteriously, thanks to the intervention of people like Rudy Giuliani and others, a deal was cut at the Department of Justice. And there was a bargain whereby Purdue would pay a fine, the executives would plead guilty to misdemeanors, they would never serve a day in prison, Purdue would pay their fines. And the most important thing was that all the evidence that was collected over the course of a four-year investigation would be buried. And in the years after that decision happened, hundreds of thousands of people died because nobody could see the damage done. And even worse, all... Uh, you know, a ton of other companies then rush into the market. They see that Purdue got off with a traffic ticket. So now they're going to rush into the market and really exploit this opioid situation for their own profit. When I saw that part of the documentary, one of the things I found myself thinking was, it's amazing how if you kill a person in America, you, you, you can go away for the rest of your life. But if you kill hundreds of thousands of people, somehow it's just a st statistic. That's right. You know? And... The ultimate irony on top of it is 
they're now paying the fines that they've been required to pay, not from their personal wealth, but rather by selling more opioids. <laughs> yes, you're referring to a recent decision um, by um, the Department of Justice, another criminal admission of guilt by the Purdue company, and Purdue agrees to pay an $8 billion fine. You think, wow, that's great, $8 billion, what a, what a tremendous punishment. And then you discover, oh, wait a minute, Purdue Pharma is bankrupt. The Sacklers have taken all their money out of the company. And how are they going to pay that $8 billion fine? Well, it turns out the way to pay that fine, because Purdue is bankrupt, is actually to sell more OxyContin. <laughs> Who makes? You, you, you can't make that up. When, you are, when you're a filmmaker, you're trying to tell us a story. You know, that's what you do in all of your documentaries. And, and oftentimes, those stories make people want to do something. In this case, I felt helpless. I was like, well, I mean, the justice, you know, the, the justice department did its thing. The, the justice had run its course, and yet there, there is no justice out there. As a storyteller, you're, you, you, you're, you're shining a light on this, but what would you hope that A, people can do, and B, people can change in what we're experiencing in the world today? Okay, so that's a really good question. And the last thing I want to um, inculcate in people is a sense of hopelessness. Because one of the things that I got out of this was that in, in, as big as the opioid crime is, 500,000 people dead, you know, many people, millions of people addicted, it, it pales in comparison to the larger problem, which is the unholy mixture of this turbo Sarge 21st century capitalism and healthcare. Mm -hmm. Last time I read the Hippocratic Oath, it didn't have anything to do with supply and demand mm -hmm. or market share. It had to do with protect the patient, do no harm. So I think all of us as citizens have got to insist now and admit that our, our healthcare system is broken and we've got to fix it. We've got to rebuild it in a way that it focuses on the health of patients rather than the profit motive of corporations who are servicing it. Well, I will say this, hopefully, I genuinely hope that as many people as possible watch this and that could be the catalyst for change that so many people desperately need in this country. Alex Gibney, thank you again for your time. Thank you again for your work. I'll see you again on the show. Great. Thanks, Trevor. Alex Gibney's two-part HBO documentary, The Crime of the Century, debuts May 10th on HBO and HBO Max. All right, when we come back, the brilliant singer-songwriter Sarah Bareilles will be joining me on the show. You don't want to miss it.